and we are live hi everyone just gonna let uh, everyone uh, log in here so we'll start in uh, just a couple of seconds hi everyone hi everyone i hope you all enjoy this morning um uh, getting ready to learn how to book more sales meetings oh, hi. So the chat works. That's pretty good. <laughs> We're testing everything here. Yeah, that's good. A lot, a lot of energy. We'll, we'll love yeah. it. Yeah, we, it was quite fun to see. We actually actually have uh, lots of people signing up for this session. So I guess uh, it's um, interesting to fill your calendar with more meetings. Uh, everyone uh, want to have more business. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm broadcasting here from uh, Stockholm, Sweden, and uh, with me here today I have uh, Thibaut. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And you're yeah it's, it's my pleasure here yeah. and where are you today? Uh, i'm uh, based morning. in berlin so right now i'm in my office in berlin in the uh, bergman kids which is like a nice area of the town yeah uh what, wonderful yeah. and we, i can see here in the chat we have people from yeah uk and uh, copenhagen uh, bosnia poland madrid wow. yeah it's crazy have you, have you been Fred have you been doing uh, events in front of people already in your career where you speak in front of 100 or you know like let's say 60 people yeah I have some public yeah. speaking events so yeah, yeah but I haven't been uh, on these big stages yeah. abroad uh, but um, because that's, that's the thing different. that is pretty cool with this is that we get like a crazy audience but it, it doesn't feel like it because we're just talking you and me so that's uh, for me I always <laughs> call it, call it the most chill public experience, speaking experience ever, because you know, you get in there and it's just, I find, I find it so nice because you just don't have the, the stress of public speaking. So I think it's good. <laughs> exactly. That's perfect. Maybe that's a good idea for webinar vendors. They should add, let's say a virtual audience. So you, you <laughs> could have everyone's cameras and create like a, a fake audience. Yeah. That would be great. Then we can see the reaction of all, I mean, all, all of you guys uh, logging in and see if you like the content or, or not. Mm -hmm. So. But uh, let's get started. Uh, and uh, once again, welcome to today's talk about prospecting and sales outreach. Uh, as I said, with me here today, I have Thibaut Soe, a prospecting as expert and the person behind the new outreach system. Um, welcome, uh, Thibaut. Yeah, thanks, Fred. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to share basically how I book uh, one outbound meeting every 50 minutes. So we're going to be super tactical in there. We're going to share some frameworks. So, uh, yeah, I guess we also have some time for Q and a, so I think if everyone, you have questions to drop them in the chat and we'll, we'll answer at the end. Super. So before we get started, can you tell me a bit about yourself? How did you end up working with, with sales? So, uh, I love telling this story. So basically I started doing sales when I was 15 years old. So, um, I basically wanted to do my pilot license. So, uh, you know, my, I wanted to be a private pilot, basically. So, you know, you have your teenager, you have this passion. And I went to my parents and I say, hey, can you pay, uh, you know, pay me a private license, a private pilot license? It's 12,000 Swiss francs, so around 12,000 euros. And they say, no, uh, basically, you're going to, you know, if you, if you want to do it, you're going to have to pay, you know, just find the money yourself. And I went to my grandfather and I asked him and he said, no, but what you could do is actually go and propose to aircraft owners in the local airfield to clean their airplanes to make money. And so that's basically what I did. And then I started going and basically prospecting aircraft owners and cleaning their airplane for 20 uh, Swiss francs an hour. And basically at 19 years old, I got my pilot license thanks to the savings before I even had my driver license. So that's basically how I started in sales. Uh, that's a quick story but then i studied in montreal where i started like a, a startup that didn't work actually like a private aviation startup and then i learned and i really landed in b2b sales in 2015 for a company called applause which is a crowd testing company and there i basically grew the french market from zero to 2.5 million of annual recurring revenue sales team from zero to 10 people and then at some point i just i felt tired of making others rich so i was like you know i'm gonna do my own business and I'm going to try and coach and train salespeople to do what I've done. And that's how I, I kind of landed in that. So I have a podcast. I have a community also. I do terror training for tech salespeople and coaching, mostly online. And I'm also like an advisor for a company called Tolstoy, which is a video prospecting company. 
Ah, great, great, great yeah. backstory. That's that's interesting to hear. And um, um, and me, I mean, my my name is Fredrik Selander. I work as the CMO of uh, SuperOffice um, CRM for uh, mid-sized B two B companies. Uh, we have a heavy footprint in the European market, and um, bringing new business to the table is, of course, crucial for uh, us and our customers uh, mainly. So that's why we're hosting this kind of event where we want to share. Uh, some tips and tricks and ideas, yeah. but uh, let's get right yeah. into it. Um, and some practical information, feel free to use the chat to comment or ask questions, and we will do our best to just pick it up. Uh, we'll, we'll cover a couple of uh, topics already. So first of all, why, why we need to do outbound prospecting and how to build your personal brand, how to define your best fit customers, identify key decision makers, uh, crafty messages, and also we will look into some efficient cadences or sequences. But first of all, so why do we need to do outbound prospecting, Tibor? So good question. Uh, love this one because sometimes we actually do outbound because we just feel like it, we have to do it. But the idea is that I like to compare uh, relying only on inbound leads, like being um, a petrol monarchy, for example. So if you're, I don't know, in Saudi Arabia right now, Great, you know, you're making good money with oil, but at some point it's going to dry out. And this is what happens all the time with inbound leads. What you have is that you have organizations that have very strong marketing teams or that generate a lot of inbound leads. And then at some point, if they want to keep growing, they're going to plateau and they won't be able to uh, actually keep growing at the rate they want if they don't do some outbound and you have other kind of ways to generate leads. But outbound prospecting is really a simple way, a very structured way to actually go and create pipeline. And if you, I don't know, you you have a goal to generate, I don't know, 20 meetings a month, and you multiply that by the number of, of salespeople you can hire who will actually do that, you'll be able to really expand uh, the number of leads and opportunities you'll generate, and you'll be able to kind of like fuel the growth you want to have. And outbound prospecting is also one of the fastest way to go to market and to understand, you know, what is your value proposition? What are the problems you're trying to solve for your uh, customers? And it's just a really good way to have control over how many opportunities you generate uh, in a specific time frame. Mm. Ah, great, great one. So I've seen a couple of reports stating that, I mean, a majority of salespeople claim prospect can be the most challenging aspect yeah. of sales. And most people, most and most sales reps put too little time and attention to outreach efforts. So why is this the case, you think? Can it be that humans by nature tend to avoid things that you feel uh, you're not good at or you're not comfortable with or what's, what's your thought? So there's, there's a few things. You have like, maybe you can take two types of SDRs who are often, uh, or sorry, two types of salespeople who are uh, often prospecting SDRs who are just often responsible for generating opportunities and AEs who are responsible for closing them, but also they're always kind of responsible for generating their own pipeline. And so what happens is, in a lot of cases, if you're an account executive, what you're going to do is you're going to focus on closing deals and then you're going to lose track because you don't have time or the organization to prospect. And what you see very often is that you have pressure, let's say outside pressure, for example, a company invested in an event. We could take an example where the CMO invested like thousands or tens of thousands of euros in an event. And then, you know, they're like, okay, we need to really leverage this event and make as many leads and opportunity out of, the, out of that. And so what happens, these people work like crazy. They send 200 messages a day, you know, day two, they would do the same. And after day three, they're just like overwhelmed with work and they just like give up. So that's the thing is prospecting is a very repetitive activity. It's just like going to the gym or working out. It's something that is healthy, but we all hate doing it because we, you know, it's something that is not like natural or fun as such. It's a very pro a repetitive activity and we just love doing other things that are more interesting. So that's very often why people don't prospect every day. Yeah, I agree. So, so I mean, Thibaut, I've seen that you have claimed some impressive numbers about your hit rate and, I mean, how you are able to book one outbound meeting every 50 minutes. C can anyone master outbound? And in that case, what's, what's your playbook? Would you like to present maybe the, the key chapters or content pieces of... Uh, of this new outreach system you will talk sure. about? Sure. So basically, for me, there's like a, a few steps that are very important. Um, prospecting first, you have to understand it's not that complicated. So you have to do the groundwork, which is really understanding your ideal customer profile. So ideal customer profile is a mix 
of the type of people you want to talk to and the type of companies you want to talk to. So I don't know if you're going after a specific organization type, let's say startups that are over 50 employees and raised over 200 million or whatever. Uh, and then you want to talk to a, spe a specific type of person in the organization. It can be a VP, CRO, whatever. So you may have like different type of individuals, which I call primary target and champions. And these people care for different stuff. So once you have an idea of who these people are and what are the differentiation, what you need to do is go and start to find what I call triggers. So you need to be able to find good excuse. So public information that tells you that these people have a problem you may, you may need to solve or an interest in speaking with you. And on LinkedIn, for example, it's going to be people liking a post, uh, commenting on a post, can be your post or someone else's post. There are so many of these kind of digital footprint you can use to find triggers. And um, basically, once this is there, you have this, you have the trigger, you have to also find the leads around this trigger. So an example, I did a post yesterday about 99% of SDRs not using video prospecting got 180 uh, likes on this post and I found three, four people who were VPs of sales, reached out to them and I say, hey, uh, see you like my post, that's the trigger. Uh, curious to know, how is your team also not prospecting or not using video prospecting? And basically when I do that, I have the right person I want to talk to, I have a good trigger to get in touch with them and this allowed me to find some leads. And once you're in there, what you need to do is to build a structure, a sequence to make sure that you contact these people and if they don't reply, you have a follow-up sequence that is structured and cadenced, really structured basically. And once this is done, what you need to do is to make sure you execute every day. So you need to build a prospecting routine, meaning that you show up every single day, every morning or every afternoon or whenever you want, and you do follow-ups, find new prospects, add this new prospect to your sequence. Whenever you're doing that, it's just like if you were going to the gas station, fuel you know put some fuel in the in the car and then the car keeps rolling if there's no more fuel at some point the car will just like you know stop stop uh, stop working that's the same with prospecting and so these are the five steps that are very important you know in my system that i i i always talk about is to make sure that you have the groundwork and build all the the kind of like you know do the, the heavy lifting early so every day when you're prospecting it's a simple repetitive task Great one. So then we have the um, overview of the chapters we will uh, uh, talk more detailed about, actually. And um, once again, questions, just add them in, in, the, in the chat. I also saw that someone, yeah, Jonathan from the Antarctica Research Station. Wow, that's uh, that's far away and, and, and India. So <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yes, Moritz, uh, we will look into the cadence uh, or the sequence uh, to go suggesting. So uh, stay tuned but if we just start here with um step one define your icp and their problems if you can have a if we can start with this first um sure step. so icp stands for ideal customer profile what we do very often is if you think about your, your job friend you often go in marketing and you work with personas or stuff like that and what we all often have is a persona is like an old guy who's 45, owns a Porsche and likes to play golf. And so, you know, if you go after this kind of person, it's cool, but you know, first, this kind of person doesn't really exist in real life. It's kind of more complicated. So what I want to do for me is to make sure I'm able to build the lead list that is relevant. So first thing you need to do to kind of like get, make sure your engine or your system works is to have some fuel. So basically some leads. And so for that, you need to make sure the leads are relevant. So ICP is a mix between the type of company. So for example, you go after startups in a certain country, another country, or you go after, let's say insurance vertical and then banking, for example. So you're gonna separate and split the type of company, the ideal customer company, we call that. And then what you're gonna do, once you have a clear idea of the type of company you wanna go after, you need to find out who are the people, the job titles you wanna go after in the organization. Because if I reach out to you, Fred, you're a CMO, you have specific problems you're trying to solve, very often related to uh, generating leads, generating revenue, uh, and all these things. If I go and talk to a marketing director in your organization, they have maybe very different uh, problems or very different things. They're working specifically on a project that can be, I don't know, uh, building a lead generation engine or something like that, which is very specific, whereas you are actually owning the strategy. So once we have these things, mm -hmm. I have an idea of who are my primary target. So let's say C-level, VP level, and then my champions who would be typically like the directors, managers, all people who are under that. 
I'm going to go and try to find what are the problems they care for. And the C-level, the primary target, they care for strategic problems. So very often it's like, you know, like far reaching projects or initiatives in the organization and they really care for that. And then, mm. go ahead. So, uh, a question here. So when, when you do this research, I mean, um, I started off in sales myself uh, and was doing quite a lot of outbound. And um, I usually use LinkedIn and I uh, visited people's profile because sometimes when you read about their responsibilities, you can see responsible to uh, grow our net new business or expand in a certain market. So sometimes you can get some valuable insights but do you have any or what's your take on this to find the problems people care for so yeah. you go and google for example a cso problem 2022 cmo problem 2022 so that's the first kind of step to get an idea and very often you're going to have research from gartner or forrester or whatever that gives you an idea this is very high level uh, but that's going to give you a, a bit of an idea what you can do too is you can reach out or look, let's say, look for podcasts, interviews from these people and hear what they say. What is the language they use? What are the problems, the initiative they like to talk about? This is really like a good way to, uh, to do that. Okay, that's good. And um, also one thing to find ideal customer profiles. I mean, um, working with CRM, uh, a, a good trick is if you have, let's say, a history of um, acquiring new customers for say, maybe several years back, you can go into the CRM system, have a look at closed one deals and associated mm -hmm. contacts. And, and you will also see what kind of job titles do they have, for example, the associated contacts. And some often you can read in the notes uh, the reason for the yeah. purchase, et cetera. So you can get some valuable insights from, from your CRM system as well. Yeah uh to help you uh, be more specific and uh, another point i guess is is uh, you want to have customer uh, customer references that is um i mean f for example if someone would like to get in touch with me most likely they will they will uh, use references other crm vendors or sales tech in general uh you know e-signature tools or someone who is maybe facing the same um customers I want to address, yeah. for example. So uh... exactly. And the thing is, uh, outbound often is confused as uh, just getting new business or new logos. Outbound is just like the fact of, and you could say, you know, like proactively going after a certain prospect, but that can be from active customers. So our lost opportunities. And so that's why using your CRM and you can do that in super office is a great way to uh, start conversations, just look at your current customers or past customers or people who have close mm. with you because these are the people who know about you and uh, you know about their problems, you know what they're trying to, to do. And that's like a really good idea to, uh, to get this uh, started. Yeah. So then we have the ICP and their yeah. problems, which is step one. So step two, hunt for triggers. Yeah. So here, the thing is triggers is, uh, as I said, it's like a public piece of information that you can use that in case someone may have a need or a problem that you can solve or an interest in speaking with you. Triggers can look like an inbound marketing, demo request, the webinar download, ebook e download, all these kind of things. But especially around LinkedIn, which is a great platform uh, because it's kind of like an accurate B2B lead database, you have people who are using the social network interacting, liking, engaging, and they leave that as a footprint. I call that a digital footprint. So basically, whenever they go and like some comment or like some post or comments or whatever, uh, they are showing you that they have a specific interest. So the idea of looking for triggers, I love to call that the Oasis effect, is to go and try and find someone who attracts the customers or the prospects you want to talk to. I'll give you an example. Uh, I was in Mexico, uh, my wife is from Mexico, so I go often there and often we have a thing called Cota on the highway, which is basically like, uh, I don't know how you call that, but it's a place where you have to pay because you use the highway. I guess you have the same everywhere. And in Mexico, Mexico being Mexico, uh, it's often very inefficient. So what happens is you end up waiting 10 minutes in line to go and pay when there's a lot of traffic. So what happens? The people who go there's people who are selling different kind of sweets, snacks and whatever. They go around this and they just walk down the, the waiting line and basically they sell their stuff. So they could go and try to prospect individually and try to find people in cities and whatever. That would be a lot of work. But in that case, they just go around the quota 
and they just find leads here. Just the Oasis effect where people are just stranded there. It's hot, it's warm. So they are actually looking for something to drink or eat. And that's how they actually you know, optimize. And that's the same thing you want to do on LinkedIn, where people are just like hanging out around thought leaders, influencers, or people who post regularly. And when they post about mm -hmm. a specific problem, a specific niche, you know these people may have a problem or an interest in speaking with you. And so that's really like the mm -hmm. trigger hunting. And the good thing is when you find a trigger, so let's say someone likes a post, uh, you know, like or a thought leader does a post with two, 300 likes, and you can go and check the people who liked, and if they fit with the ICP, then you can reach out to them using this post as a trigger. And that's how you actually mm. get like a lot of replies. So I've got, got a question here from, from Pierre. Can we expect results without using triggers? Uh, and uh, Sebastian is asking if LinkedIn is your preferred first contact method. And, and um, uh, before I let you, uh, yet, let you answer, Thibault, I, I was thinking about, when I've done some research um, outbound before, I also used, let's say, really Google and see that sometimes they are active on uh, Twitter or um, Facebook, yeah. etc. And you can see, okay, they're they're Arsenal fans or yeah. they're you no, know, they're a fan of some kind of hobby. So uh, you you can actually use any kind of trigger <laughs> you have to get a reason to reach out. Uh, just my my, yeah. my five cents here so so basically on this type there's different types of triggers obviously triggers that are like that can be uh, use, useful i always recommend to go and try to look for triggers that are rele relevant and not so much hey you're a fan of this you know let's talk because that's kind of like you're trying to create rapport which is something that is great when you're doing a call but it's hard to kind of get people to be like oh you know i'm gonna go in a call just because i'm a fan of whatever it shows people don't do personalization it's a good trigger but for me, it's always can I find a trigger that is really relevant and shows that they are into this, let's say, solution or problem awareness and that they are, you know, we're trying to talk here. Mm. On the question of Pierre, can we expect results without using triggers? Yes, you can, but you're going to have lower results, meaning less replies. You're going to have to contact more people to get an answer. So it's always really important to kind of go and find some triggers. There's all different types of triggers. It can be company triggers, can be personal triggers. You can do assumptions based on their job title and what happens in their lives or what happened in their career. But always try and basically find a way to reach out. So you always have to find to reach out and people have to actually say, okay, this person knows what I'm going through. This person understands my problem. So I'm going to reply. That's basically what you need to do. Good one. And, and, uh, when we have been sp speaking before here, you also mentioned that you can use other people's posts to find leads, but you can also use these posts to add re relevance to your own outreach. How, how, how is that? So I'm going to give you an example. So, uh, you know, in sales, in my industry, it's very easy to find triggers. I have like a lot of uh, uh, people who are, you know, talking to the same people as me. So I'll give you an example. We have a lot of uh, uh, people at Sales Loft. You know, there's, for example, Charlotte Johnson, who's uh, at SalesLoft. And here it's very interesting because you can use your competitors. So uh, in my case, she's not a competitor, but selling to the same type of people as me. And so whenever she posts, she gets three, four, 500 likes. So that's really good. And she posts often about how to prospect, you know, how to do a specific video or how to use a podcast to prospect or whatever. So whenever, you know, you have a post about how you can use a prospect to your know, podcast to invite uh, prospects in there. What I do, I go around all the people who liked, I check the, the, the post likers, and then I just select the ones that fit with my ICP. So all the VPs, directors, and these kind of things. And then what I do, mm. I craft a connection request on LinkedIn or first message if I'm already connected, where I say, hey, noticed you like the post of Charlotte about using podcast to prospect. That's basically like the trigger. And then I add a teaser or a question. I'm saying, uh, what are you doing to prevent your team from, I don't know, turning off a prospect with pushy called outreach, something like that. So that's really how you use triggers and you include them into your outreach. So this is good. I guess this is a good transition over to the step three, which is build and use sequences uh, and how to create a, a sequence, a skeleton or a yeah. framework. Would that be a good fit to start talking about this now when we have now, okay, well now we know that we have a trigger, we have the, the right person. So how, okay, how, how to actually do the outreach here. Let's, let's just go and share our slides here. Anyone, can you see our slides? 
I can see it at least. So, uh, yep. Okay, cool. Yes. So here's an example. First thing you need to do, you need to make sure that you're not going and writing messages like crazy. You need to first define your sequence. This is a skeleton of my sequence. A sequence is one goal, get a reply. Uh, he also has one goal, get you to stop focusing on prospect when you don't have a reply. You have people who do like 30 touch point sequence. That's too much. For me, it's like five, six touch points. That's enough. Uh, you know, it's really based, based, based on who you're selling to. But for me, it's very simple. I actually define my steps. So step one is like a soft connect or connection request on, on LinkedIn. Then what is my step two? What is the place or the channel and the media? So it's going to be on LinkedIn. I'm going to drop a video. Then I'm going to be still on LinkedIn and drop, and drop a voice note. Then I'm going to switch to email. I'm going to drop a video. Then go back to LinkedIn, drop a video, and then finish with LinkedIn again. So it's really LinkedIn-centric, but you can add calls, whatever you want. Once you know your touch points, you have to create a cadence. So how many days are you waiting for between each touch point before you actually go and do your follow-ups? For me, it's two business days, so it's pretty simple, and you stay within, let's say, two weeks like that on one prospect. That's the first thing you need to do. Once the sequence is there, you need to build the content, the script that you're going to use. And here it's very important to have like some kind of snippets and scripts that you're going to use. So you don't go and every day when you prospect, you have to reinvent the wheel and craft a new message. So for me, I use a specific trigger. That's an example where when someone downloads my sequence, I say, hey, first name, notice you recently downloaded my LinkedIn outreach sequence for your team. Does that ring a bell? That's an example for an inbound lead. But that can be something like someone goes on my profile or the example I gave you with Charlotte before. And here, what I'm doing here is always the same, where on each touch point, I have the structure. Let's focus on this one here. Question, teaser, call to action. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, what are you doing to prevent your team from turning off prospects with pushy LinkedIn messages? So really the idea here is I focus on a specific problem because here, if I'm going out to head of business development, this is something they know about. They are dealing with it every day. People are just prospecting and doing connect and sell and that doesn't work. So I'm saying, how do, what are you doing to prevent that? And often nothing because they don't know how to do it. So here I'm teasing a resource. If you're into it, I'd love to share a quick video on how your team can start generating conversations with prospects on LinkedIn. And I finish with a simple call to action. Let me know and I'll send it over. Let's pause on that. What I've done here, I didn't say anything about my business, anything about what I do and how we are the best and whatever. I just say, do you have this problem? If you do, I have something for you, but just reply and I'll actually send you, send it over. And that's really the idea here is to tease curiosity I like to call it the Netflix effect. For example, I'm watching uh, Selling Sunset season five with my wife right now. Have you heard of that or not, Fred? No, okay. I haven't. No, People I haven't. in the chat, if you heard of Selling Sunset, just tell me. Basically, it's like real estate agents in uh, Los Angeles like that are selling super luxury houses. And it's basically an excuse to see women fighting, basically. And it's very trashy and it's super fun to watch. So uh, basically you end up and then they just like start fighting, whatever. And then you're like, I want to, you know, they, they cut the episode and then I want to see what's, hap what's happening. And that's why we do binge watching on LinkedIn. Oh, sorry, on Netflix. So, uh, you know, David has his wife addicted to it. You know, my wife started watching it and I was like, I love it. <laughs> so that's exactly yeah. what you want to create. Yeah. As a side note, I know as a marketeer, uh, I think the, the beauty with these messages is, is, it's about them. It's not about mm -hmm. us. So just yes, to your point, these messages are hundred percent about those we reach out to because we care about what matters to them. So, uh, I also think this is a good way of build, start to build a relationship, being curious, talking about the other people. So, uh, exactly, good exactly. And, and so that's, that's basically that this, that's the start your sequence. Every message has to be optimized for that. So you really want to go and get this conversation started. You don't want to book a meeting or that's what you want, but it's not like, you know, that's the first thing you want to go. You really want to get a reply. Once you get a reply, your goal is to navigate the conversation. So make sure that, you know, once you share the resource, there's a thing called the reciprocity bias, which is a unconscious bias we have as humans, no matter the culture where when someone gives us something, we feel obliged to give something back. So that's why when you go, and uh, you're in the market and people give you like a cheese to try, you cannot feel obliged to try the cheese, to buy the cheese after. So, you know, that's why they do it. And that's exactly the same we're doing here. We are proposing a resource and once they're interested, we know they're interested. 
we share the resource and then basically it's very easy to ask them questions and try to do a small discovery to see if they have a real problem and when they do they're going to be so happy to jump into a call and it's a real opportunity you have there is that why you need to buy a, a beautiful lady a drink in the bar to get a kiss yeah that can be uh can be another option it's been a while i didn't do that you know i've been married for i mean not so long but uh, <laughs> I, I stopped uh, doing these kind of things a while ago <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good okay so step four um yeah so is this the last step of your so here what or? i'm doing and you're gonna like that um I'm basically following the example of a landing page. If you look at a good landing page, it's structured in a way, you know, I'm simplifying here, but you have a problem statement, kind of like solution. Then you have a testimonial or social proof and then a FAQ. So here I'm doing something similar where I'm doing like a, a, a problem here. So um, I mean, in this one, I, I kind of did the mix, but here it's like kind of like more of a solution. So how you can, you can uh, do that. Then here it's like, I'm going to do like an email where I share, I say, hey, I got these people and they had some really great results. So it's more like the social proof. And then I finish with this one, which is more like the FAQ. So do you have this problem one, problem two, problem three? And then I finish with the bump, which is any thoughts, which is a really good way to get conversation because you're switching from having a lot of, oh, it's not too much, but some text to having no text and just like, can you reply? So basically that's the idea. And by the way, I'm going to share the sequence there. Uh, yeah. And it, between step five and six, you have, um, what should I say, do, do, do you have a waiting time as well? A two day to work, uh, two, two business, business days, days example, between or... each. Yeah. You could okay. do three, you can change very, but for me, I just keep it simple. So it's not too, uh, too complicated there. Is, is this like something you have, um, I mean, experienced over the um, the period you have used the sequence that like two is the, the perfect mix or balance yeah. or is it just i found that two is good because it's two business days so it means, let's say you start on monday follow up on wednesday follow up on friday and then another follow up on tuesday so it gives this kind of natural mm. rhythm where it's not too much pressure but it's enough pressure because if you work two weeks you know mm. you're gonna basically book one meeting every i don't know 50 months <laughs> so that's not the idea and if we go back to, I can do like this to um, the first sequence here. You, you said type voice note and type yeah. video. Is this, are you using, let's say, the LinkedIn built in feature for this, or does it matter if where you? So for it? voice notes, yes, I use a feature on LinkedIn, which basically once you're, it's only in the app. So once you're in the app and you connect there, you know, you actually can go to people. So I'm going to find you, for example. You have your phone with you? Uh, yeah, I have, I have. And there's a small microphone button that I can click here and I can talk and I can send it over. Can you show everyone what's on your uh, LinkedIn if you have there? Here's my, yeah. yeah, here's my LinkedIn. I hope you can see it all. Yeah, we so can see it. Yeah. Message from... This yeah, so. is what we call a pattern interrupt. So instead of seeing a text message or whatever, you see a blue bar with a play button. And as humans, when we see a triangle this way, we know it's a play button and there's music behind. So we love music. Mm. So we click and because, you know, that's one of the things your messaging has to be creative and relevant. And the creativity part is like using pattern interrupts. So the type here is voice note video. I always recommend using a tool called Tolstoy. There's other tools or whatever, but like it's a prospecting video, video prospecting tool where you can record, really share your screen, add some call to actions. Mm. That's going to generate like mm. a preview with a GIF and the link, and you can put it anywhere that where there's a link and people can go and see that. So that's uh, mm. the there. Yeah. And I guess um, I see some comments here. I mean, there are many, of course, tools that, that yeah. can help. Uh, Loom, VDR, these are video. all great tools. Yeah. And, and uh, I guess you can use similar, um, I mean, also in your email outreach, yeah. I guess. You can also copy, similar. paste, and then, you know, there's going to be a moving GIF in your email. So it's uh, it's pretty good there. Mm. So, and then you have, so voice note, do a video, and then on step four, you, you mentioned yeah. email. So where do you find this email address? So here, uh, it's pretty simple. Like emails follow patterns. There's tools like Hunter. Uh, drop contact or any mail finder, which are great tools to find emails. 
So um, you can basically go and kind of try and get an idea. So you find the domain, you put the first last name, and then it kind of goes and ping the domain to find if it's valid. It's not always mm -hmm. like really accurate, but you get like based on the on the software you use, maybe 70% hit rate, where in 70% of cases, you're going to have a good email. Again, it's something mm -hmm. you can do. I kind of like, this is an example of a sequence I used to use. I don't really use email anymore because emails are becoming super crowded and it's very, very hard to actually reach out to people with emails. LinkedIn is great because when you connect with someone, you can connect out of the blue. If they accept, it's actually legitimate interest or there's really no issue with GDPR. So you don't feel like, okay, I'm going to be in trouble because of that. Because some people feel like uh, using email or guessing emails is not legal, which I think mm. is very much of a gray zone. There's nothing that says you can't. There's all this kind of legitimate interest, which is like very important in Europe, that in LinkedIn, it's not even a question. So basically, mm. that's that's why I do that. We got a question from Ekaterina about using email. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you haven't done the connection request first, you will need to do email, paid email. So what's your take on this? So emails for me are great, are great tools to make money to LinkedIn. LinkedIn, they make a lot of money with emails. You don't. That's the third problem is emails are terrible. The reason is that when you receive an email, it kind of lands in a parallel box there's a small sponsored and it kind of like screams, I want to say something to you. So people, what they do when they see an email, they ignore it. It's very, very hard. And the thing is, emails are generated as like mass kind of advertising stuff. So you as a marketer, you know about that. So it's kind of like mm -hmm. this thing where they sell you as a campaign of hyper personalized campaign, where they send, they blast these similar messages to like a group of people who fit with a persona or an ICP and they receive that. So you're going to send, I don't know, a uh, thousand emails and maybe you're going to have like a one or two percent conversion rate or reply rate. Great if you're a marketer, yeah. not great if you're doing B2B sales because you're going to have about you know, 30 emails a month. So the idea is like emails are great to make money for LinkedIn, but not for us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I used it as a marketeer and, and, and the benefit with, with emails is often you get a super high yeah. open rate, like 50% open rate. But uh, I agree that getting conversions out of it is uh, is more tricky, unless you're you're having a I mean an amazing yeah. offer uh, or very timely. Yeah, nice. So uh, what you do I'm... is the lead doesn't add you to the network. So here that depends. For me, if you have like a sea of prospects, it's fine. The idea is your connection request. You need to optimize it for acceptance, not for reply. So the connection request, there's a very simple rule. Mm. If you have something relevant to say, use it. So if you found a very powerful trigger, you say, hey, so you're like here, curious how you're doing this, whatever. So you can, you know, do that. Or if you don't have anything relevant to say, just don't add anything. You know, people will based on your picture headline and your name and number, number of people in common, they will make their decision. And very, very often they will actually accept you more. You know, if you have like a no message compared to a message that is just irrelevant. So that's the idea. With this, you're going to be between 50 and 70% acceptance rate. This is largely enough in general. So for me, I just basically contact to five out of five people, maybe four will accept, and that's largely enough. But if you want to be a bit more, you know, thorough, then you can include emails and maybe calls also to these people. So can you repeat that? So what was um, your um connection request success rate? Was it 80%? So between, for yeah. me, it varies, but around 70%. 70%. Okay. So I guess this can create a new subtopic. I guess this could be a follow-up talk even, but how to really build your uh, LinkedIn profile and presence, because I can assume, I mean, if you, if, uh, uh, what should I say? If Elon Musk would uh, reach out to me with a connection request, I would say yes, yeah. right? Uh, because you know, because of several things: uh, domain authority and uh, I mean, uh, title, job company. So there are yeah. things. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that we, as individuals uh, or salespeople, can do something with our profile in, in order to improve this uh, reply yeah. rate, right? Right. So you know, the thing is. Um... Often people just go and, and look their LinkedIn when they're on the move, on their phone or whatever. So 
you know, if it's a long text, it's actually a bigger investment to go and look for it. And if in the first few lines, it doesn't look relevant, they ignore it. So that's the idea. In doubt, just don't put a don't, don't put a message. And it's always great to kind of like try and 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 uh, A/B test with or without and see what works best for you. But in general, people just write terrible connection requests, so don't include anything. Hmm. Let's see. We have some questions here in the chat. <laughs> so. Uh, I Duny asked a tricky question here, right? Uh, I guess it's a, a typical sales um, challenge. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you, you have uh, uh, people uh, rejecting you or even your sale. And, and uh, I guess you have something to answer here. But, but, but from my point of view, I mean, it's, it's, sometimes it is uh, it's not a good fit, but sometimes they, don't, they, they need to know yeah. more. They don't have all the bits and pieces connected. So... Um, Okay. Yeah. Thibaut, what's so your when people say point? no, move on. For me, it's very simple. Like I've never understood why you know, when someone tells you no, people feel like they have to go and try to do some objection handling and whatever. They just don't want to talk to you right now. So fine. Basically, that's when your job as a marketer, Fred, is to make sure that you get these people educated. So if you're mm. reaching out to them and, and basically you can ask them and say, okay, fine. Is it fine if I, you know, like drop you a quick resource? You know that you can download so you receive regular emails from our marketing team you can ask that that would be like a, a good kind of reply because people will say no not interested or ah oh, yeah maybe not right now but later so i give you like an example i receive like uh, uh, i'm uh, you know following a lot of newsletters and, and stuff like that and um, you know it's it's just like the basic stuff where if you provide value regularly where you help people you know do a specific job uh, these people will see that and at some point you know in most cases they won't be actually ready to buy because they don't have a problem but at some point you know they mm. will receive that and when they have the problem you know if you provided a lot of value through marketing through content on linkedin they'll be like the first thing i need to first person that i will contact because i need to to solve this problem is this person and then they're going to contact you so that's really what i would do is you know move on but make sure you know try and get them to be nurtured or to be in contact with your brand basically it's a good one. And, and as, a, as an example, I will share uh, just a prospecting tips blog article um, just, just to illustrate um, to, to Thibault's factor that, I mean, uh, as a marketer, I often say that like it's only one, one to 5% of your target market is actively looking for a new you know, CRM tool or a uh, new consultant or whatever. So the majority of your market is not ready to yeah. buy. At the moment right so um and, and and for us as marketeers what we need to do is is um keep on delivering content and build a strong brand affinity so when people are ready to buy we are top of yeah. mind uh so th this is how it needs to work in tana with sales and marketing so marketing marketing being maybe one step ahead and, and educate the market nurture the market and then sales can start a conversation and build a relationship with the individuals yeah. so exactly. this is good exactly so now we have uh 50 minutes left and we have two more steps to cover which is navigate the conversations uh and maybe and this is also part of the sequences and then build a routine yeah. uh should we yeah should we go sure. ahead to the next one? so navigating conversation is what happens when you got a reply so if your sequence really worked well so we can uh, basically stop sharing this um, so if the sequence worked well you have a reply people say hey i'm interested or you know in, in maybe checking the resource you talked about and here what you need to do is we use what i call the reciprocity resource so again very simple uh, if you have a marketing team, like, you know, even the worst marketing teams are delivering ebooks, webinars, whatever, sh stuff like that. This is content. They, let's take this webinar as an example. If you are reaching out to people to get them to actually prospect better, what you can do is say, hey, uh, if you're interested, I have this quick resource on how uh, you can book one meeting every 50 minutes of prospecting. What you're going to do, you're going to take a link to the replay of this webinar and you're going to say, this is a long webinar, one hour. So to help you actually go and uh, get the most value, I've timestamped the best points. So, you know, we take the five steps we had, you timestamp it and you say, okay, uh, groundwork, ICP metrics and everything, it's at three minutes, 55, whatever. So you send basically this resource to people 
and you're curating the resource here. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Like marketers know the problems. They talk about it all the time. That's their job. So reuse their content and you say, okay, mm. so uh, this is the specific thing. This is the resource. This is what you get. And if you want to explore more, you can get the whole thing. And you can also book a call with me uh, if you want to know more. And very often people would just go check and then they will get to know more about the, the brand, more, more about what you do. They'll get a clear idea. And in some cases they say, hey, I'm interested to talk because I think you can help. In most cases, they, they, won't actually re, they won't actually just follow up. So you say, hey, what have you thought of the resource? Is it something that is relevant for you and your team? And very often they say yes, no. If they say yes, you say, okay, tell me a bit more. You say, ah, you know, yeah, my team is actually struggling with that. I share that with them. And that's when you can ask a negative reversing question where you say, would it be a bad idea to hop on a quick chat? So you can tell me a bit more about that and I can see if we can help. This is a really mm. good way to have conversation. And once you have that, you're really able to uh, book the meeting and have a great meeting because you know someone has a problem, they've uh, self-educated with your content, and basically you just have to guide them to the solution. Mm. So it's this negative psychology. Negative uh, 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 reversing question, we call that. Oh yeah, ne negative psychology, call, 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 call it, where you say, would it be a bad idea to do that? Yeah. And looking into um, the routine, so like find out how many prospects to add to your sequence daily, how to, let's say, execute on it. Would, would you like to bring yeah. us some clarity in, into this, how, how to put this sequence into action so this is the most important point the thing is if you do everything we've talked about but you don't do a prospecting routine you're going to fail if you don't do anything we talked about but you do a prospecting routine you're going to succeed so that's the thing is prospecting routine is just about building consistency um you know let's say going to the gym hitting healthy these are all habits you know that are hard to make but once you picked it it's a lot harder to actually i mean it's a lot simpler to keep doing it than breaking it that's the same with prospecting. So the idea of the prospecting routine is first step to define what I call the cruising altitude, which is a number of prospects you need to contact every day to reach your targets. This comes from, uh, basically I was a private pilot, as you know, and when you were doing a navigation, you were always calculating from point A to point B, what is the minimum altitude, the cruising altitude you need to have to make sure you don't hit the mountain or an obstacle. The mountain is your quota. The cruising altitude, the altitude is basically the activity level you have. So once you know how many prospects you need to contact, it's really about finding this amount of prospects every day, following up and contacting these new people every day. So really creating the engine where you follow up, find new people, contact them. When you do that, you basically, you know, go from, let's say, having to close, I don't know, 1 million a year to having to contact, I don't know, 20 people every day. And so whenever you're doing this, what you can do is create a time block in your calendar to make sure no one is stealing your time at a regular time every day. For me, it's from eight to nine. So before this event, I was actually prospecting. You know, I did my stuff and it's done. So you do that and every day you execute. And when you're doing this over a few weeks, you'll see you'll start having meetings regularly, very predictably. And that's how you create like the, the prospecting routine in the, and you put the system to life basically. Sounds sounds easy, right? It is. <laughs> so, so do you, are you doing? Let's say, how do you let's say block your calendar, or how do you? Yeah. How do you ensure the consistency? You put here? a blocker in your calendar, and the blo the blocker protects your time from customers, but also from your manager, from all the distractions you have. So you make sure that this mm. is there in your calendar, and people just can't book you. You know, they can't bother you because you, and if your manager is like, hey, we need to talk, whatever, you say. You know, you you are responsible for helping me achieve my goals. And mm. the thing I need right now is to be focused on my prospecting. And this is every time, the same time in the morning or afternoon, every single day. And basically, I cannot go to meetings. I cannot talk to people. I cannot do interview. I cannot do anything else than this when in this time 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 slot. Mm. And if your manager is like half how like he's, he's just a not dumb, they will be fine, you know, because this person is actually doing the job that I'm paying them for. Yeah, I 100% agree, right? This is, uh, I mean, it's crucial to do prospecting to have enough meetings to uh, close and turn into into business. But um, when it comes to, let's say you have, you need to reach out to 20 people mm -hmm. a day, as an example, would you um, start doing the, um, 
search and selection on the day or do you do it like the day before or do you do it weekly so you have okay next yeah. week i will reach out to these 100 people and i will just put it into chunks or so i would really recommend doing it every day where every day you have a bit of a you i always recommend you start with follow-ups because that's the easiest you go to your uh, tracking you know like can be a crm in super office i'm sure you can do that you look at your list and you follow up and you just like say okay this person has been for you know touched last time two days ago i'm going to send a message because it's step three or whatever you just do that so super simple once this is done you good and look for these 20 new people go on linkedin go in your crm look at your lost ops and whatever select the people and then contact them if you do that every day you're mm -hmm. breaking out the tax the task every day and it's always a simpler task than blocking a whole afternoon to do like 200 find 200 leads so really when you're doing this it's a bit of it every day it's consistency it's becoming a routine it's becoming something you're comfortable the, with and and it's not simpler mm. so when i was doing cold calling uh, for me it was important to block off time um when the prospects were most yeah. likely to, to respond and that was me in the morning they were maybe driving to work the the, the managers were you know sitting in the car or maybe also in, in the afternoon, actually, when they are <laughs> heading back uh, to pick up their kids, etc. Yeah. But uh, when working with LinkedIn, um, would you say it does it matter the same that you do it um, on the same hour as the prospect work? Or since, since LinkedIn is often something you consume when you're a bit bored, you have five, you have five minutes or yeah. something. Uh, between meetings, you pick up the phone and you scroll through the feed. So an input on that one. So I think, it, it, you know, LinkedIn is really an asynchronous touch point. So it doesn't matter that much, uh, in my opinion. Call calling is obviously very different. So if you're call calling, you have to make sure it's at the time where people are most likely to pick up. So you can time block at these things. But for any asynchronous communication, I don't think that matters that much, as long as you're doing it every day. Mm. And uh, that's, that's good. Okay, let's see here. So I think you had a slide. Did we show the last slide of your deck here? I think or, we did, yeah. Uh, okay, that's good. And we, you shared the deck, that's super. Okay, then we can actually open up for some yep. questions. Uh, I know we have someone in the chat we haven't had good time to respond to already. Let me see here. Um, I mean, Ekaterina asked a good question. So what, what to do if the lead doesn't add you to the network? Uh, yeah, that's the question we were answering. Yeah. Yeah. Or just, that's uh, the question we answered before, where basically what you have to do is uh, um, you optimize your connection request so they accept. And if they don't, you try and either move on or try and go through email or calls. Yeah. Mm. And is it all, I mean, I, I saw some numbers somewhere on LinkedIn. You can you can reach out to like I think it's like one hundred people a week or something. Yeah. So there are there's some kind of cap. Yeah, there's a cap. Yeah, the number. Well, you cannot go like crazy above twenty a day is hard. Yeah. Okay, so twenty a day is like some soft yeah. cap. You yeah. should uh, think about. Okay, that's good. Okay, I see a call. It's capped at around one hundred. Yeah. Okay. And, and does anyone know if if you have let's say you reach out to fifty and they all accept, do you get new? credits or... i don't know i don't really the thing is uh i think it's not like that okay. it's just they are very it really depends uh on you know, that's the thing it's a social network that is a b testing on different users so some may have more some may have less so it's very hard to predict okay that's good uh good question from pierre how do you ask for a referral smoothly um good question so the referral is something it's more something you will actually ask at the end of uh i mean when you already have like let's say an ongoing relationship so uh, a good thing i found and this is like a really good example i got from skip miller from proactive selling mm. is to go do what he call like um, a re referral email so basically you do a thank you note say hey thank you for actually reaching out uh, I would love if you know of anyone who, you know, if anyone you know would have a similar challenge, I would love to actually talk with them. So can you just forward this email? And then you end up with the email with PS. If this person forwarded you this email, you can reach out to me here, basically. And that's a very simple, smooth way because they just have to forward. And then it's very really simple like that. That's good. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so self na sales navigator profile with an active profile. Okay, you can get above 100 okay. connects, connects 
Okay, you need good. to warm it up, basically. So uh, the activity has to stay consistent. So that's the idea. Mm. Let's see here. Uh, we got a question from Travis. So when using a video outreach, it looks like you pair it with text. Do you use text that match the video content or make it different? Uh, so basically some text before the, the link, I guess. So for me, like the text, I, I always try to make the text go with the video where the video has a title. So for example, when there's the video, I say the name of the person, check this out. So it would be Fred, check this out. And then I would introduce that by saying, made this for you. You know, made this for you, the link of the video. So then you're like, what is that? And then you click on it because you're curious. So that's how we use it. Mm. And, and you also mentioned uh, at, at one point that you should have, let's say, uh, a repository of snippets or uh, uh, some pre-written text so you don't need to put too yeah. much time adjusting it. I, I guess um, the level of uh, personalization that also depends, at least in my opinion, uh, I mean, if, if you are selling to large enterprises, yeah. so you only need to hit, let's say, one or two uh, meetings to secure yeah. your quota, yeah. I, guess you, I guess you can put some more time to personalize it, but if you are selling uh, more high volume you need to find a more uh, exactly uh, and you per can personalize the trigger often that's what is the thing you personalize and the rest is not too personalized but it's always about being a bit flexible around your sequence and you know whenever you have something you're like okay that's gonna be relevant feel free to to play with that mm. that's good let's see here uh Maybe some last question here. Okay, we have some Carl. Does it matter if you do the invites at all in one go? Currently, I task myself on Monday afternoon to send out 100 direct invites all with pitch message. I build my ICP list with Sales Navigator. Would you say this is an effective method or stick to daily invites from Carl? Uh, t -t -t all in one go. The problem is if you do everything on Monday afternoon, 100 connection requests, you're going to get in trouble with LinkedIn. Because it's too, it's kind of like very, very spammy, basically, to do like 100 at once. So the idea is if you're playing with LinkedIn, you have to play this kind of consistent game. So for me, I would say that uh, doing it a bit every day, so 20 a day instead of 100 on Monday, is going to be a lot simpler, a lot healthier, and you won't be afraid to be striked or blocked on LinkedIn. So that's that's what I would say. Mm. And uh, a good, good one. And uh, yeah, e, e Catherine, you mentioned something. Do you think it's important to po post frequently as an SDR, like educational posts, to attract activities, etc.? And 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 if I just add in here, as as a as a marketeer and let's say someone who firmly believe in in building your your personal brand, I, I would say it will it surely helps. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, yeah, like you, Thibault, and and other people being very active. I know a lot of BDRs, SDRs, account executives, they've managed to build a brand yeah. bigger than their, you know, the executives exactly. of the company. So they get a lot of, you know, inbound requests. And uh, so, so business is coming yeah. in. And on top of this, they, they, they will have much easier to get do connection requests with new prospects. So I would say it's a win win. And so, and as a marketeer again, uh, use the content the marketing team is producing yeah. for you but also mix it with your own opinion maybe you find a, a forbes article or a gartner report or whatever so often you can just just bring the content that is already produced with a small comment yeah. I, I really love love this five-step guide or something absolutely like that. yeah and often it's really like it's a whole other concept uh, of content building but it never hurts to go and share your experience you know and your how you're going through you know, like you're just really good, like what you're, you're going through and documenting your progress. It's always a good idea. So, and that was the last, last question. And thank you all for attending this, uh, this session. So one hour, it goes quickly when you, uh, talk about the topic you, you love. And this is, uh, this is truly a topic, uh, close to my heart, uh, working with, uh, prospecting and, um, CRM sales, etc. Yeah. Um, Please reach out to uh, myself or Thibault if you want to connect. And uh, I know both of us, we have a lot of content. So on superoffice.com, we have a super popular blog with everything you need to learn about sales and sales and marketing and service. So 
just have a visit. And uh, you also got a link to Thibaut and his deck. So thank you for yeah. watching. Thanks, and everyone. Enjoy. Thank you.